Charlie Paddock joined in the celebration. For the first time in Olympic history, the 100 meters title had gone to an entertainer. He was more than a champion, he was a phenomenon. But as the flamboyant American enjoyed his moment of triumph, an earnest Englishman was preparing his own formidable challenge. In 1924, the Olympics returned to the land of their founding father. More than 3,000 athletes from 44 nations marched into the Cologne Stadium on that sunlit afternoon, and they were welcomed by their president, Baron Pierre de Coubertin. The Games of Paris were the fulfillment of his dream, yet there were other dreamers in that famous stadium. There was the incomparable Finn, Pavo Nermi, who was to take three individual gold medals the idealistic Scot, Eric Little, preparing to beat the world over 400 meters. Douglas Lowe, soon to extend the tradition of British success at 800 meters. And there was a young English lawyer just down from Cambridge. His name was Harold Abrahams. Abrahams was born in the last month of the 19th century. He was the son of a Lithuanian Jewish immigrant, a hard-drinking, unstable man who had made a sizable fortune in the city. Two of Harold's three brothers were fine athletes. One, Sidney, competed in two Olympics himself, and they quickly spotted signs of real talent in the baby of the family. In his early teens, when his parents separated, he was sent to Repton Public School. It was not the happiest experience, but in an interview given in later life, he explained the part it played in forming an exceptional character. I wanted something to justify myself. There was a quite a deal of anti-Semitism at school in those days. And I had to find something where I could score off people. And running, of course, you can do it. You can get first and you can win, and I was determined to do so. After Repton, he went to Cambridge, where he read law and dabbled in liberal politics. But his athletic improvement was dramatic. He was chosen to run for Britain at the 1920 Olympics. Inevitably, he was soundly beaten, but the transformation was already underway. The turning point came in 1923 when he joined forces with the legendary coach, Sam Musabini. Part French, part Arab, and raised in London's East End, Musabini was a powerful motivator. His ideas and results were impressive. Abrahams was to be changed from university runner into an Olympic star. It was a formidable alliance, and his training revealed the kind of single-minded determination which bewildered some of Harold's contemporaries, including a young Arthur Porritt. His training methods were Today's training methods are absolutely unknown at that time. He wasn't a professional in, to the extent that he was getting any remuneration for it at all, but his whole approach to it was, as I say, miles ahead of his time. Harold received a dubious reward for his dedication. When the British selectors announced the team for the 1924 games, he was alarmed to discover that he had been chosen for four events. The Daily Express published an article suggesting this was too much for one man. The selectors read the column, called a meeting, and dropped Abrahams from the long jump. Only later did they discover that the famous international athlete who wrote the article was Harold Abrahams. Yet despite all his preparations, Harold was deeply pessimistic about his 100 meters prospects when he arrived in Paris. He knew his biggest rivals among the 75 entries would be the four Americans. Jackson Schultz was positively charming. Lauren Murchison and Chester Bowman were amiable enough. But the arrogant Charlie Paddock was the man Harold most wanted to beat. And the reigning Olympic champion soon learned to respect Abrahams, who began in impressive form, equaling the Olympic record of 10.6 seconds. But the semi-final brought problems. That man next to me got a fly and there wasn't a recall. 
And I was a good yard and a half down in the first ten, and I kept my head. Really, I'm more pleased with that than winning, but I did come through, and I won. And I knew jolly well I couldn't lose after that. The final was held on the evening of Monday, July the 7th. The favourites had come through, all four Americans and Abrahams. Yet the sixth finalist was astonished to find himself in such company. Arthur Porritt, representing New Zealand, was still more astonished to receive a kindness from Harold, a man he scarcely knew. After the semi-final, Harold came to me and said, would I like to share his hut with him in that awful three hours between the semi-final and the final on the same day? Here was a man who literally had devoted his whole life for a year to winning this race. And, and now he'd reached the most crucial stage. And yet he was willing to take in somebody that he only knew vaguely to let him share the sort of peace and quiet and his trainer and his thoughts and his master at that very last stage. And I thought this was a wonderful gesture. On their return to the stadium, Harold was greeted by the Prince of Wales. They shook hands, and the prince wished him well. Then, just before seven o'clock, Harold walked out to the track. He was still fighting nerves and tension as he warmed up, but he muttered the final advice of Mussabini. Think of two things, the report of the pistol and the tape. When you hear the one, run like hell until you break the other. They lined up. Porritt, Murchison, Bowman, Abrahams, Schultz and Paddock. Then they were off. Abrahams first, Schultz second, Porritt third. For Harold, the race was sheer simplicity. I just found myself glorious feeling, just going a little bit faster than the others, and through to the tape there. But you see no victory ceremony. So I think some of these victory ceremonies are rather nice. I, a bit regret that I didn't have that. A typically reserved reaction, but Porritt, who took the bronze medal, knew precisely what victory meant to him. He was obviously delighted, you could feel it, but being Harold, of course, he didn't show it. But on the other hand, I, I, I could feel that all his tension had gone, and he'd achieved what he'd set out to do. The effort had exhausted Harold. Although he helped Britain to a silver medal in the sprint relay, he ran poorly in the 200 metres and finished last in the final. But he had achieved his objective. The first European to win an Olympic sprint title, the only Englishman ever to do so. His regrets about the lack of ceremony now seem justified. His prizes arrived a month later by mail with insufficient stamps. And before he could lay hands on his Olympic medals, the fastest man on earth had to pay excess postage. The family were very proud of him, but there is a touch of arrogance in, in the Abrahams as they expected him to do well. And uh, it wasn't a case of sort of waving flags or anything. It was, <clears throat> well done, and let's get on with the next thing. Abrahams never defended his title. Indeed, his athletics career was almost over. It ended abruptly at a minor club meeting at Stamford Bridge in 1925, where he badly injured a knee competing in the long jump. I was very uncertain about what to do in athletics. And here, I had no option, my mind had been made up for me, and I had stopped dead. Although his running days were over, Harold was determined to retain his contact with the sport. And in 1925, he became athletics correspondent of the Sunday Times, a job he held for over 40 years. When the BBC began to broadcast athletics, they chose Abrahams as their resident expert. That dry, analytical mind proved invaluable to the coverage. He was really brilliant at this. It was his life's work. He would have a board in front of him, and on the board would have little slots for his watches. He'd always have one, two, possibly even three watches. He'd have a red pencil for world record, and a green pencil for something else, and so on. Incredible, and he managed to do all these things while still talking about a race. His coolness became his trademark, but just occasionally that coolness would yield to the emotion of the moment. Throughout his life, Abrahams was acutely aware of anti-Semitism, and those Berlin games in 1936 presented him with a moral dilemma. He never forgot he was a Jew, and in fact, he had to be persuaded to go out to cover the 36 Olympics of the BBC. 
and one of his great friends, I think it was Lord Simon, said to him, no, we should have a Jew there and let Hitler know the BBC have a Jew there. By now, Harold was a contented family man. In 1935, he had married the divorcee, Sybil Avers, a happy marriage which lasted until Sybil's death 28 years later. After adopting two children, it was perhaps the most satisfying period of his life. My mother was a, um, had been an operatic singer and had been in Doily Cart Company, and my father absolutely adored um, her and Gilbert and Sullivan. It was a sort of absolute passion with him. Um, my mother produced various local operatic societies, um, and my father's voice was absolutely terrible, so he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't actually even be in the chorus. productions he'd always enjoyed and of course at home they, they'd listen to the, the gramophone the old sort of wind up thing in 78s and they I think our entire record collection was Gilbert and Sullivan I don't think we had anything else. His passion was Gilbert and Sullivan his great eccentricity was his devotion to time he got up at six went to bed at ten and always wore three stopwatches. I mean I do literally time almost everything I mean speeches at dinners going upstairs and over to the test beds. I once handed my stopwatch to a dentist while I was going to have a tooth out. And he did it, and when I woke up half drowsily, I said, how much was that? And he said, four minutes, eight seconds. And I said, oh, Lord, world record for a mile. <laughs> Abrahams lived for athletics and broadcasting, but his arrogance made him a controversial figure in the sport, and especially later in life. Some of his most bitter battles were fought with professional coaches. He looked upon them essentially as Sam Musabini's, as, as social inferiors, as people who should speak up when they were spoken to, instead of men who were going to help the amateurs. There were also those who could see a damaging conflict of interest between the official positions of Abrahams and his ally Jack Crump, and their other roles as media figures. I mean, I felt it was quite appalling that in the early days of television, uh, the two men who conducted the negotiations for athletics, for the contract with the BBC, it was only the BBC in those days, were in fact two people who were employed by the BBC. People were never neutral about Harold Abrahams, and he never expected neutrality. In Chariots of Fire, he was portrayed as single-minded, sometimes aloof and often arrogant, spurred on by those who resented his Jewishness. His family described the film as pure fiction. But there are those who agree Harold could be difficult. He said what he thought, and he said it quite openly, and sometimes he said it pretty hard. Uh, perhaps he wasn't feeling enough. And th this, I think, all came out of the fact that he had achieved this, at the time, magnificent result. Harold Abrahams was loved and resented in equal parts. But when he died, in January 1978, hundreds assembled to pay tribute to the most influential figure British athletics has known. His contribution to the sport spanned more than 60 years and his influence lingers on today.